Hey, this is Ken the Metal Professor. It's time to talk about related rates. Everybody's favorite Calc 1 topic. When I do these videos, sometimes I call them recently on Math Reddit because I'm sort of making a video response to a question that was there because a lot of times doing it in video form is actually better than just trying to type a bunch of stuff and then other people can enjoy. Um, this started that way, but it's been several days since the original Q&A and other related rates problems crop up. So let's just make this sort of an overall theme, not necessarily tied to the math subreddits there. Um, but related rates problems, I've subtitled this, their bark is worse than their bite. Um, everybody tends to have trouble with these at first, but once you unlock them, they end up becoming very, very samey. Uh, and so the secret is to not be intimidated and to know what to look for. So let's break these things down. So first of all, pay attention to the difference between what you might have called regular math versus this Calc 1 stuff that uh, you're getting into, okay? Old math, old boring regular math was very static, right? Uh, suppose there's a geometry question. You have a cylinder, it has a certain radius, it has a certain height, and maybe then you're asked to calculate what is the volume, okay? So it's very static. The cylinder is just sitting there, or the sphere is just sitting there, and it has measurements, and you use those measurements to find out other measurements, right? Very static. Calculus is where we come along and we turn on the power switch and let these values start to change, okay? Uh, here is a cylinder and its radius and or its height are changing, like maybe the height of the cylinder is growing. How fast is the volume changing based on the rate of change of that height, okay? Now already some buzzwords are creeping in here, rate of change, uh, and this turning on of the power switch for a particular geometry is done by inflicting it with the derivative with respect to time, okay? Now, before we even start getting into equations, let's just talk about units because these are crucial and they can also give you a foothold into a problem and do some diagnostics about whether you're about to apply a formula that's ridiculous or a formula that might be correct. Okay, so let's, let's take that cylinder again and its dimensions are radius and height. And let's say they are given in centimeters, right? Well, then we know that the volume of this cylinder in the static problem has to be in cubic centimeters to be consistent with the radius and the height. See, no formulas at hand, right? We just know that. Volume is in cubic length units and radius and height are established in centimeters. So we're gonna expect the volume to be in cubic centimeters. Now here comes that power switch the dimensions of the, the cylinder start to change and maybe the rates of change of those measurements are given in centimeters per second. And so then we know that the rate of change of the volume to be consistent with these units is going to have to be in cubic centimeters for the volume per second. That's how fast the volume is going to be changing. And if you can track these units before you start a problem, you're, you've already won half the battle through a related rates problem. Okay, now related rates problems are word problems by their definition. And everybody says they hate word problems. Well, everybody starts by saying, when are we gonna use this stuff in real life? And then we say, well, okay, here's a really simply over, oversimplified scenario that before you do those real life things, you have to be able to solve these sanitized problems. And then everybody says, oh no, I hate word problems. Okay, but it is what it is. So. Uh, the thing about related rates problems is that they're all going to boil down to a geometry. Now, the, the verbal description of a scenario of a problem is going to have a bunch of noise in it, right? But if you can see through that noise, you're going to recognize that no matter how, how descriptive the scenario is, it's going to boil down to something's involving a circle or a rectangle or a sphere or a cylinder, maybe a triangle or maybe the distance between a couple of things, which effectively is a triangle, right? Um, things like that. So everything's gonna boil down to a geometry. And then there are going to be magic words in these related rates problems, which are gonna tell you what you're looking for. And those words are how fast. These are the words that are not going to show up in your old static pre-calculus problems or at what rate, that means the same thing. 
right? So when you find the magic words, how fast is this particular quantity changing or at what rate is that quantity changing? This tells you what you're solving for mathematically. You are solving or you're looking for the derivative with respect to time of whatever quantity that is. So like words, 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 and then the question stops with how fast is the surface area of this thing changing? Whether it's a cylinder, whether it's a sphere, I don't really care. That just means if A is the surface area, you're looking to find the value for dA dt. Um, here's a scenario that, ooh, look, it set up a triangle for us and we're trying to figure out the length of the hypotenuse, how fast it's changing. So if C is the letter that represents the length of the hypotenuse, we are after dc over dt. Uh, a cylinder or something that has height, a cone, right? It has height. How fast is this height changing? Well, we're looking for dh over dt. Here's two things that are moving. How fast is the distance between them changing? Well, if capital D is the distance, we're after the derivative of distance with respect to time. Now, this is, I think, what's the biggest stumbling block in related rates, and that's that, okay, you're, you're looking for a rate of change with respect to time, but none of these geometric formulas have time in them, right? So what the heck? How are we supposed to do this, right? Here's all, a whole bunch of formulas for areas and volumes, and there's a, you know, hypotenuse versus the opposite and adjacent side and a right triangle. Here is a distance between two points, all sorts of geometry. None of them have time in them. So how are we supposed to find rates of change with respect to time? Well, remember that these are all the static formulas from the good old days. Um, we turn on the power switch with a derivative with respect to time. And I hear crinkling in the background, meaning my dog has uh, tipped over my garbage can. So I'm gonna pause this for a second. Okay, that's what I get for uh, taking my sub wrapper from my lunch and just squishing it up and throwing it in my garbage can. Every time I do one of these, the dogs are either barking or now they're getting in garbage. Okay, back to related rates. Okay, we have all these geometric formulas. I got to get myself back into this now, right? All these geometric formulas. Eventually, we're looking for the rate of change of one of these parameters with respect to time, but time does not appear in any of these. So how do you get it in there? Well, that's the power switch part of this, which is we take a static geometry, you know, just like a cylinder that's sitting there, and we know the formula for its static volume, and then we invoke the power of calculus, and we turn on the power switch by finding the derivative with respect to time of both sides of this formula, okay? That introduces the time dependence. Well, it doesn't introduce the time dependence. That's already there. T itself never shows up as a variable. Whenever we'll plug in like T equals five for five seconds, but the influence of time is in the background and you bubble that up to the surface through these derivatives with respect to time. Now, there has to be what I call the snapshot instant in the problem. All right, look at it this way. Uh, we have a sphere and the radius of this sphere is increasing with respect to time. We might want to know how fast is the volume changing with respect to time. So the radius is increasing at four meters per second for per minute. Four meters per second is pretty fast. So let's say four meters per minute. Um, and we wanna know how much volume would get added in a certain amount of time, like in a minute. Um, see, the thing is though, if the radius of a sphere is increasing at a fixed rate, the, the net volume that gets added in a particular window of time depends on whether the sphere is small, like a softball or a bowling ball. In one second of the radius growing, there's a certain amount of volume that gets added there. But imagine if your sphere is the sun and the radius of that is increasing at the same rate, the net volume that gets added to the sphere in that one second for the sun is gonna be much huger than the amount of volume that gets added during that one second for a bowling ball, right? So it's not just about the rate of change of the radius related to the rate of change of the volume. It's also, we have to take a snapshot and say, at this instant, how fast is the volume changing based on the geometry of the problem? So 
We're given the, the geometry. We're going to have some fundamental static formula that ties together the variables. We are going to turn on the power switch by applying derivatives with respect to time. And then we're going to take a snapshot, click, stop, freeze frame. At this instant where we've frozen time, now we plug in all of our numbers and figure out the rate of change that we're after. How fast is the volume changing at that instant? So let's dissect a problem like the one I was just describing. Um, the radius of a sphere decreases at a rate of three meters per second. Find the rate at which the surface area decreases when the radius is 10 meters, okay? So first of all, just make an assessment that this stuff makes sense. Here's a sphere, its radius is shrinking, so its surface area is also going to be shrinking or decreasing. So what's going on? Well, we have a sphere and we're interested in its surface area. The radius decreases. This is giving us a rate. I mean, it explicitly says at a rate of, and the numerical value for that rate is negative three, and that value is dr over dt right? Meters dr per second dt, dr over dt. And then that negative sign is there because the radius is decreasing. So the radius is going downhill. Its derivative with respect to time is negative. Okay. The rate we want to find, well, the question is at which, uh, find the rate at which the surface area decreases. So we're looking for ds over dt at the instant when the radius is 10 meters. So there's our snapshot. So the geometry, a sphere. What information are we given about rates already? Well, we know the rate of change of the radius. What do we want to find? The rate of change of the surface area. And when is our snapshot? Uh, it's at the instant that the radius is 10 meters. Now, like I said before, let's just think about the units. We haven't put an equation in this at all yet. Now it's gonna be an easy one, but let's think about units before we even see the equation. Um, what units do ds over dt have to have? Well, if the radius is in meters, then the surface area is going to have to be in square meters. And since the time involved is meters per second for the radius, and the surface area is gonna have units of square meters, then the rate of change of that surface area is going to have to be in square meters per second. The reason you want to think about this before you go into setting up your related rates equation is that you know ahead of time what units to expect. Your formula has to produce those units correctly. And if you come up with a formula that isn't going to produce in this problem square meters per second, that formula is wrong. And you know that before you start wasting your time plugging a bunch of numbers into it. Okay, now how do we get there? Well, geometry, sphere, geometric quantity we're after, surface area. Surface area of a sphere is 4 pi times the square of the radius. Okay, now how do we turn on the power switch? Well, Surface area depends on radius, radius depends on time. So T, it does not appear as a variable in the formula for the surface area, but it's in the background because radius depends on time and surface area depends on the radius. There is a chain of influence from time to radius to surface area, okay? Now, you have to be somewhat adept at the chain rule to make this all work. And the chain rule that describes this scenario is that, uh, if the radius depends on time, so we have dr dt, um, and just from the formula for the surface area of a sphere, we're going to be able to calculate ds dr. The product of those two derivatives is going to produce ds dt, right? And you can see, okay, you're not really supposed to do this, but we're all friends, and so we can pretend. You can imagine those drs canceling out so that this right-hand side is equivalent to that left-hand side. So this is the related rates part of thing. This rate is related to this rate. <laughs> the rate of change of surface with respect to time is related to the rate of change of radius with respect to time. And the handshaking is done by the old fashioned static formula for the relationship between surface area and radius. So that equation is four S equals four pi R squared. The derivative of that with respect to R is easy. It's eight pi R. And so, the related rates formula for this problem is ds over dt equals ds over dr, which is 8 pi r, times dr over dt, and there it is. 
Now, um, the R and the DRDT colored in the magenta, those are the values that the problem gave us. And the DSDT is the value we need to find, right? Easy peasy. Now let's have a sneak preview of units. Remember that DSDT had better turn out to be in square centimeters per second, given the units that appeared in the problem statement. Now this eight pi doesn't have units. R, or sorry, meters. R is gonna be in meters. DRDT is in square meters per second. So meters times, did I just say square meters per second? But rewind, whoop, whoop, whoop. R is in meters. DRDT is in meters per second. That product will be square meters per second. Eight pi doesn't change that. And so the units of DSDT are indeed going to be in square meters per second. And so we can be confident that this formula is a good one. If we came up with a formula and the, the, we just said, what are the units going to be? And, you know, maybe we decided that the right hand side was going to give us cubic meters per second. That can't be right because we're after units of surface area. And so we know to just throw that formula out and not waste our time plugging numbers into it. But we can be confident with this one. And so kind of from the beginning, S is four pi R squared. DSDT is eight pi R times DR DT. Um, plug in the known value of the snapshot for the radius. Plug in the rate of change of radius with respect to time. And there is DS over DT, all simplified, negative 240 square meters per second. Right now, I just talked about this problem for I think over 10 minutes, but look how much, look how long it takes in terms of analysis, right? Once you get good at these things, they're pretty straightforward. What's your geometry? Well, a sphere. What quantities are we tying together? Radius and surface area. Well, there we go, surface area of a sphere. Turn on the power switch by invoking derivatives with respect to time. Plug in the given rates and the given snapshot value of the variables and figure out the one you don't know and you're done and out of there. Okay, deep breath. Let's take a look at another related rates problem. This time where two things are going to be changing in the problem, not just a radius of a sphere like in the last problem, but uh, two quantities are gonna be changing and leading to a rate of change for some third quantity. So the base of a triangle is shrinking at a rate of one centimeter per minute and the height of the triangle is increasing at a rate of five centimeters per minute. Find the rate at which the area of the triangle is changing when the height is 22 centimeters and the base is 10 centimeters. Now this is interesting because here we got a triangle, its dimensions of uh, base and height are in having opposite trends, right? The base is shrinking, the height is increasing. Which one's winning in terms of taking over uh, in determining whether the whole area is increasing or decreasing? Okay, but let's break down the information here. Well, what's our geometry? Well, it's obviously a triangle. The quantities of interest are radius, height, and area of this triangle. So the relevant geometric relationship is area is one half base times height. That's the formula for the area of a triangle based on its base and its height. Let's look at given values. Well, the sentence in blue, the base of a triangle is shrinking at a rate of one centimeter per minute, tells us that B, the base, has a rate of change dB dt is negative one centimeter per minute. Similarly, for the height is increasing at a rate of five centimeters per minute, that is dH over dt. What rate do we want? Well, the question is find the rate at which the area of the triangle changes. So we want dA over dt. Um, the necessary units of dA dt based on the units of B and H being centimeters and time being in minutes, dA over dt had better turn out to be square centimeters per minute. And like in the last problem, these are not units that we just save and stamp on there at the end. Those units have to develop properly through the equation that you're applying. Our snapshot instant happens when the height is 22 centimeters and the base is 10 centimeters. So this triangle um, base is shrinking, height is increasing. So the triangle is kind of, I can't do both of those things with my hand at the same time, but the, the size of the triangle is changing and snap, we snapshot at a particular instant and do all of our calculations. Because again, if the triangle is only this big and the radius and height are changing at those given rates versus the triangle being this big 
and the radius and height are changing at the same values, the net change in area for this triangle is going to be remarkably different than the net change in area for this triangle. So it's not just about the rates, it's about when we're applying the rates as well. What snapshot are we going to take of this dynamic system? Okay, now both the base, sorry, that should be base and height there. Both the base and the height of this triangle are changing. The contribution to the rate of change of area is coming through the base and through the height, okay? Which means we have two contributions to the rate of change of area with respect to time. But these get built just like in the previous problem. Uh, in blue here, dA over dB is how uh, the base, the, the change in base affects the change in area and then how the change in time affects the, ch affects the base. So dA over dB times dB over dT two rates, or sorry, one rate and one derivative. Uh, for height, here is the term that tells us how the rate of change of height with respect to time influences the rate of change of area with respect to time, dA over dH times dH over dT. Both of these terms, again, we're not supposed to do this, but let's do it anyway. Imagine we cancel out the dHs and cancel out the dBs, both of those terms simplify to dA over dt. So the blue term is the contribution to the total change in area that's channeled through the base. The magenta term is the contribution to the change in area that's channeled through the changing height. Now there's five derivatives all in play here. One formula, again the formula does not have time as a variable, that's okay because we're going to be constructing the rate, the related rates that are related through the derivative, okay? Well, dA over dB, well, let's just come back here to the formula for area, the derivative of this area formula, A equals 1 half BH, with respect to B is 1 half H. And dA over dH, well, the derivative of this same formula with respect to H is just 1 half B, okay? Um, so we've taken the the non-time derivatives and implemented what they look like based on the static geometric formula. And then we have three different rates still involved, but we're given two of them and we're solving for the last one. So back on the previous screen, remember we were given a snapshot at the instant when the height is 22 centimeters and the base is 10 centimeters with the base shrinking at one centimeter per minute and the height increasing at five centimeters per minute, what is dA over dt? Well, we have the value of height from the snapshot. We have dB over dt is negative one centimeter per minute. Uh, base, 10 centimeters at that instant. Rate of change of height, five centimeters per minute. Now watch the units. Height and base both have units of centimeters. The rates of change, dB, dt, dH, dt, both have units of centimeters per minute. All in all, the units of each of these clumps is going to be square centimeters per minute, meaning the overall units on dA, dt are going to be in square centimeters per minute. And before we even started this slide, we already knew that's what we needed to expect. And so it's all good. We hope it's all good. The final value for that is 14 square centimeters per minute. So the height is winning. Even though the, the base is shrinking, the height is increasing fast enough that it's winning and the total area is growing. Okay, third example. Try to make this faster yet. Um, there's a helicopter starting on the ground that it's rising up into the air at a rate of 25 feet per second. Uh, you are running on the ground starting directly under the helicopter at a rate of 10 feet per second. Find the rate of change of the distance between the helicopter and yourself after five seconds. I'm playing with my tablet because I want to be displaying a figure here in a second. There we go. I'll come back to that in a minute. I talked so long on the last problem that my tablet timed out, so I had to reestablish its screen sharing. Okay, so helicopter going up, us running on the ground away from where the helicopter was. Find the rate of change of the distance between us and the helicopter at the instant 
when five seconds has gone by. Okay, what's the geometry? Well, it's triangle, right? Helicopter's going up, we're running away, so there's a vertical edge, there's our running path, which is gonna be flat, and the distance between us is the hypotenuse of that triangle. So we have a triangle, or call it a distance problem if you want. Um, the data is the height of the helicopter, we'll call that H, the flat ground distance to the runner, we'll call that R, and then the actual distance between the runner and the helicopter, we'll call that capital D. Well, it's a triangle. We got the two side, right triangle actually, we got two sides and the hypotenuse, which is capital D, so D squared equals H squared plus R squared. Maybe it's time for that picture, right? Helicopter is going up, runner is going, you know, directly away, and then there's a distance between the copter and the runner. This is our right triangle. Now those numbers that are on the diagram well, they're coming from this paragraph. Um, we are told that the helicopter is rising at 25 feet per second, so DHDT is 25 feet per second, and the runner is moving away at 10 feet per second, so that's DR over DT. All right. Um, we're looking for D, capital D over DT, the rate of change of that diagonal distance, the hypotenuse of the triangle. The units of that distance are also going to have to be in feet per second to be consistent with the others. Our snapshot is at the instant when five seconds has gone by. Okay, Now, the geometry doesn't have a place to plug in five seconds, right? Um, but because we know the rates of change of the height of the helicopter and the distance of the runner away, at least on the flat ground, after five seconds, well, if the helicopter is rising at 25 feet per second, after five seconds, that helicopter is 125 feet up. Um, the runner is moving away at 10 feet per second, so after five seconds, that runner is 50 feet farther down than where we were to start with. Okay, so this is a little more subtle. We're actually given a value of time, but we use that to generate the corresponding values that are in the geometry that we have set up. Okay, so here's the, the right triangle with the dimensions. Um, we're given a rate of change of R, we're given a rate of change of H, and we're asked to find a rate of change of capital D after five seconds. That five seconds gives us a length for R and a height for H. That also gives us a length for D, but it doesn't tell us yet how fast that capital D is changing, and that's the whole point of the problem. So the hypotenuse squared, length of the hypotenuse squared equals h squared plus r squared, Pythagorean theorem, distance formula, whatever you want to call this. Um, we need to find how the rates of change of h and r influence the rate of change of capital D. Just like before, we're going to hit both sides of this with a derivative with respect to time. The derivative of capital D squared with respect to time is 2D times D capital T over DT. Um, for the H squared, 2H times DH DT, and for R squared, 2R times DR DT. So this is again the chain rule, implicit differentiation, whatever you want to call it. H and R depend on time, so capital D depends on time, and here is how. We want capital big D rates of change over time. We are given dh dt were given dr dt we found out h and r after five seconds all right so all the good stuff is there we're going to have to calculate this capital d at that snapshot that's no big deal um, we are going to need the rate of change of capital d with respect to time to be in feet per second now here's how this goes uh, h is in feet dh dt is in feet per second so this blue term 2h dh dt has units of square feet per second, and similarly the 2R DRDT has units of square feet per second. So this whole right hand side has units of square feet per second, but so does this single capital D on the left. And so when we divide that to the right hand side to isolate the derivative of big D with respect to time, we're going to have square feet per second divided by feet, the net result, feet per second, good stuff. If we're not gonna get feet per second for the derivative of big D with respect to time, our formula isn't the right formula. 
Okay, and then here's that last issue, right? At our snapshot, we know that H is 125. We know that R is 50. Well, in order to complete plugging in all of our numbers to this so that we can find the numerical value for D big D over DT, we've got to know big D itself. Well, that's just a quick run through the Pythagorean theorem through the original geometric formula. So when H is 125 and R is 50, well, D squared is 18, 125 square feet. So that capital D is 25 times the square root of 29 square feet, right? There's some simplification going on. You can pause this and check it out if you need to. But now we have all the numbers for H, for R, for DHDT, for DRDT, for capital D, we just figured that out. The only thing we don't know is big DD over DT. Crunch, crunch, crunch. So the final value for that rate of change of distance with respect to time is 145 over the square root of 29 feet per second. And again, watch those units working out. Right-hand side, square feet per second, cleaning up by dividing by feet from the left-hand side, net result feet per second. Man, that's good stuff. Some of you might be bothered by that square root of 29 in the denominator. If you don't like it, fix it. Okay, last one. This one's actually going to be straightforward. I just want to emphasize that the rates can go in the other direction. Like these, there was geometric quantity equals this formula, and we had all the rates on the right-hand side to calculate the one on the left. Here's one where it goes the other direction. Okay, so we have a cube and a volume. That's not very interesting. But the volume is the thing that we're being told what its rate of change is. And so we need to find out what rate of change of an individual side generates that rate of change. So the previous problems, if we did this one like them, we would have had the, the rate of change of a side of this cube and asked, been asked to find the rate of change of the volume. This time we're given the rate of change of the volume as a whole what was the rate of change of the sides of the cube that led to that, okay? But it's one thing at a time. The geometry of this, it's a cube. What data do we have? We got the volume and the length of any one of the sides. The relevant geometric static relationship is V equals X cubed. No time to be seen at this level of formula. That is fine because we turn on the power switch by taking derivatives with respect to time. Now we're given the volume of the cube decreasing at 10 cubic meters per second, and so dV dt is negative 10 cubic meters per second. Think ahead. What units are we going to want for dx dt? Well, they're going to have to be meters per second, right? They have to because of the units of volume. Now, we haven't seen a formula yet for dx dt. And we don't need to to understand what units to expect. Our snapshot is taking place when the cube has a side of length two meters. So here comes the math. We start with V equals X cubed. Turn on the power switch with a derivative with respect to time on each side. Three, sorry, X cubed goes to three X squared times DX DT. Can we confirm that our DX DT is going to end up in cube in just meters per second? Well, the left-hand side, dv dt, is, in, is given in cubic meters per second. This x squared is going to be in square meters, so when we divide it to the left-hand side to isolate dx over dt, cubic meters per second divided by square meters, what's left over? Meters per second. Good stuff. The value given for dv dt was negative 10 cubic meters per second. Our snapshot was x equals two meters. So we have the value for the blue term on the left. We've got x equals two gonna go in there. And now we saw for dx dt, no big deal. The net result is negative five, six meters per second is the rate of change of the length of a side of the cube. Okay, so there's four examples of related rates. Hopefully you're getting a sense of the, um, you know, the similar process that you can take through every one of these problems, no matter how much noise is in the problem description, identify your geometry, identify your dimensions, come up with your static geometric formula. Don't get freaked out that there's no time in a static geometric formula. You don't need it there. The influence of time will come through finding derivatives with respect to time. You'll have values for rates of change that go along with that derivative, you will relate those rates of change to the rate of change you're looking for. You just have to handle the formulas right, pay attention to your units,
figure out before you even get into the calculations what units that your answer has to come out in and make sure that your formula will produce those units. You can't just wait to the end of the problem and plonk the units on. They have to develop naturally and correctly. Okay, these four problems, you know, if I took related rates and separated problems into sort of three tiers of difficulty, these four are probably still in the first tier of difficulty, um, but there's no point worrying about the other tiers until you can successfully handle problems like this. So I'm just gonna stop with these. If you have any requests for other topics, or if you want me to go further into related rates with some more complicated examples, um, with more complicated geometry or more complicated tying together of some of the information in the problem, let me know, metalprofessor at gmail.com. My website is metalprofessor.com. Um, yeah, I hope this helps. Let me know if it does.